Okay, well, thanks very much uh, for giving me this opportunity, uh, Frank, to talk to the, the New Yorkers here. Um, I'm from this uh, the, a company called Structure 101. Anyone here heard of Structure 101? I know these guys have. Uh, a few have, okay. Um, yeah, the sort of concept for Structure 101 started a long time ago. I'm, I'm a co-founder of the company. Um, and uh, I said, back in the day, I used to work on, on this uh, project here. It's so bright, I can't even see my red dot on it. I love the equipment here. Uh, that's a flaw. <laughs> um, I, I worked on this project here, the, uh, the International Space Station Program. I worked up in Canada, and we're working on these little guys here. They're not very little, they're quite big. The station structure itself is, uh, is huge. Um, and they were like robotic systems which were used initially to build the station while it was under construction and then for maintenance and so forth. And it's still used. Same company that built the, um, you've probably seen the shuttle holding the, uh, the Hubble telescope and stuff like that. So there's a company that specializes in space robotics. Anyway, it was cool. I saw a man for that and said I have to go work on it. I have a really, really interesting project. But one of the most interesting things about this uh, project, from my point of view, was that it was multidisciplinary. Right? We're working with kind of like real engineers, right? mechanical and electrical, electronic, um, uh, and, and just you know everything was, was was a system. And you're working with all these guys who have their own kind of processes and things. And I was always very envious of these guys because. You know, their requirements documents and their design documents and what have you sort of had little bits of this in it, you know, something tangible um, that you could look at and kind of understand even if you weren't in, you know, an expert in their discipline, okay? And uh, meanwhile, we were working in this kind of stuff, right? Which is just like, it just, it's not the same, right? It's not as tangible. It's software is a very different kind of a beast than uh, the other kinds of engineering. And it's particularly interesting because they try to shoehorn engineering processes onto the software process, which is where things like waterfall and stuff came from. Uh, now, we did have design documents. Um, here's an architecture diagram or a design diagram, if you like. Um, for some of the code that we were working on uh, on the space station program. And there was a certain amount of kind of science behind this stuff. And you would sit down, you'd look at your requirements, you say, now how are we going to build that? And you come up with something like this. And then people would start coding. Okay. But very quickly, the thoughts and the really good stuff that went in at this level was lost as people were just left really working uh, at the code level, right? There was no real uh, feedback loop for you to understand why you were coding, what is it that I'm coding, and where does that relate to in the architecture or the design of the system, okay? And likewise, the guys who were responsible for making sure that this stuff got built as designed had a really hard time to figure out really what bit of the code relates to which, I, you, know, you go through all this science and it's like, you know, that bit of code belongs to that architectural component, right? It's very loose um, at that point. And not only that, but there was this general feeling, and I saw it on, on subsequent uh, large uh, projects, uh, I was uh, worked on some uh, large Canadian defense uh, and communications projects, where, you know, there was a lot of this kind of science going on, but at the end of the day, you've got a room full of people hacking code, and you've no real way of joining the two together. So that's where Structure 101 has really come from. And um, that's what this talk is really about. How are we going to close that loop, bridge the divide between architectural thinking and the actual implementation in the world of software? How are we going to do that? So why do we want architecture? Um, well, few reasons. Right? It's like it's a map. 
it's like a roadmap for your developers. Okay, they have helps them find things and know how how to work on the system. Phased development. Right? If you've got um, 20 or 200 developers all working on the one, one system, you need to kind of break that up a bit so that your guys can work on, some guys can work on one system, it can go through its own testing and then it, it, it gets fed on to the consumers of that system. You can't do that unless you have some kind of architecture. Okay. Dividing the work across individuals and teams all those beautiful benefits of uh, modularity that we all learned in Software Engineering 101. Okay, information hiding, defining the interface, um, isolation of change, all that good stuff comes from architecture. Reuse, replace subsystems. You can't do that when everything needs everything else. Okay, not going to happen. You have no choice to do that. Impact and regression control. When you make a change, do you know what's going to get impacted by that change? Quite often we don't. We make the change, we see what breaks, we fix that, and then we fix that, and then we fix that, and we come back to where we started. Okay. These are big things, right? These are really important things. Okay. So what we're really talking about is engineering, productive development. Okay. So that's why we want to do this stuff. So we don't, this is where we're at. How are we going to get to a situation? where we get those benefits that we expect from an architecture in our software development world. So, summarize, I suppose, where we're often at, right? The norm often in our, in our industry is that any architecture is not really real. So where you have an architect, you have something in a document or something on a whiteboard or whatever, Unless it is explicitly and automatically mappable to the code, and unless the code is mappable to the architecture, it's not real. It's, it's a pretty picture. Okay. Quite often, um, people get people to very interesting uh, exercise to do. Get people to draw a picture of what their code, what, what is their architecture today. Okay. Then get someone else to do it. Someone else is also familiar with the code. Right? How do they relate? And then look at the actual code, automatically visualize it, and look at the actual dependencies, and compare and relate. I mean, that's a great exercise to do. Um, the second thing is that any structure or architecture that you do have is probably invisible. You don't know, it may be there, and it may relate to what developers have in their heads, but you can't really see it. And so it's not really helping very much. The idea of architecture, it's not for computers don't give a damn about architecture. Right? It's the developers, the human developers that need some kind of visualization and a way to abstract from all of that details. Let me see the bigger picture. That's for the developers. So if we can't see it, it's actually not helping anybody. Okay? And worse than that, that your, your structures that you are implementing, the ones you can't see, are not getting any simpler. They're not getting any tidier. They're getting worse and worse as, as time goes on because they're invisible. Okay. And all of that tends to fight against development. This is why as code bases get bigger and bigger and more and more complex, that productivity doesn't tend to get any quicker. Right? So, version one, as a sort of a, this is the kind of thing that I'm going to suggest that we need to do. Um, start with what is real. So we've got this situation, right? We have a load of code. We might have some pretty pictures on whiteboards or in documents or in, you know, in the wiki or somewhere. Um, and we've got a load of code. We've got a code base, right? So how are we going to bridge this gap now? How are we going to get ourselves to a point where we've got all those beautiful um, uh, benefits that I put up on the slide? We're going to start with what is real now in the code, okay? First thing. Second thing is we're going to attach a bit of architecture to the bits that are good there. Right? Don't have to solve everything. We're not going to come up with just what's good. Lock that down uh, as a piece of architecture. And then we're going to use that toehold to grow an architecture so that the code base evolves into a nice, uh, clean, cogent architecture. <coughs> That's what we're going to try and do. 
How are we going to do that? <laughs> well, first of all, I said, well, what's real? Well, the first thing that's real, this is a diagram that describes the, um, that shows the, the dependencies between the methods inside a class. So we've got a class here called uh, Campos, here. And it's got a main uh, function in it and a bunch of other functions, and they depend on each other in some way. Okay. This is real. Okay. You don't often see it just like this, but probably your developers who are familiar with this particular class when they're in working on it inside the IDE, have something like this in their minds, little bits of this in their minds. Okay? That's real stuff. Okay? The other thing we have that's kind of real is if you come up a level now, forget about the insides of classes, there is a sort of a class hierarchy structure that's hanging around, and classes depending on classes, which again, you don't see this uh, every day when you're working in your IDE, but it's, some of it is in your head. You kind of keep track of these kind of things. You learn them as you go along, as you become familiar with the code base. That stuff is real. Okay. <coughs> Problem is, this is uh, kind of a, looks like the microwave background radiation map of the universe. But uh, what it's uh, indicate, what it's uh, a graphic uh, implying is all the dots there are classes, and all of the gray stuff are the dependencies between the classes. Well, there's probably a few hundred here. That's not a big code base. You've got something like that, and probably much bigger, 10 times that size uh, on a large project. Yeah. And this is real, okay? You have real code. It compiles, it runs, it does something, okay? So this is, this is goodness. Um, the other thing we have that's real is the organization of that into Okay, so you're going to take your classes. They're going to be organized into packages, generally speaking. And the packages are organized into modules. Okay. So the classes themselves are just, there's too many of them. It's too big. That's not giving us, that, that's not giving us those six or eight bullets on my, on my slide at all. Right? When the guy is working inside here, even if he had a map that looked a bit like this, you know, he's working on something here, and it's got a dependency on something here and here, and it's being used over here and here, and it's probably using back up again. I mean, I don't, that's not very helpful to it's too much complexity. That's what architecture is supposed to help with, that level of complexity. Computer loves that complexity. People, not so much. Okay, so now let's look at the packages. Well, Inside each module, you're going to have uh, packages that look, you know, something like this. Um, the what I've done here is I've sort of made a 2D representation of a tree view. So you've got the kind of containment in, in the packages within packages within packages kind of thing. Um, and the interesting thing really then is to look at the dependencies between those, which is going to look like something like that. Um, and if you look in close, what you typically find unless you've been monitoring this stuff from the start, is it's a big tangle of mess. It's not particularly useful as an architecture. It's not helping me in any particular way, other than it's kind of like a namespace that helps me sort of locate things and gives me an idea of where to look for particular classes, perhaps. So packages, are the package level of composition, not particularly uh, useful from the start. What about modules? Well, the good news is that modules are actually pretty good. So by modules, I mean things like Maven projects. You're inside your IntelliJ or Eclipse workspace, you've got Eclipse projects or IntelliJ modules, Java 9 modules. Uh, you've got uh, Basil, came up earlier on. You've got anything, any build system tends to insist that at least your dependencies are recycling. This is really good from an architecture point of view. Cycles are, I mean, if you've got cyclic dependencies, then everything depends on everything, so it's really useful. Acyclic dependencies, very useful. Okay. So they're not bad as a place to start. Okay. The only problem is that you're probably going to find that while you've got this beautiful structure at the top level, 
you've only pulled out a few of these components for configuration and things, and then you've got the meaty ones in there, maybe one or maybe a few really huge, um, relatively huge uh, components, okay, or modules. So there are your monoliths. So modules are not bad, but it's kind of lumpy for an architectural point of view. But it's somewhere to start. So this is kind of like where I think we're going to start uh, with our process of bridging the gap. Is we're going to start using the modules first, and then we'll see what we can do about pulling up where we've got those big lumps. We're going to pull up the the the, the, uh, the packages. If can we sort out something there? And ultimately, what we're doing is organizing classes within that. Okay. So bridging the gap, I suppose, version two. Step one, visualizing the structure you have right now. Step two is lock in and shore up any good architecture that you have right now. Right? Make that formal, make it explicit, and overlay it on the visualization. So at least people now, when they're working, they've got a visualization that helps, and they've got some sort of goodness that is additionally helping them. And then finally, you're going to extend that architecture, that toehold of architecture, uh, into the deeper regions, into the monoliths. And as we do that, every as we're going along, uh, at every step, you should be getting a bit of bone, a bit of uh, kickback uh, for your development pr uh, productivity. Okay, let's drill into um, how we're going to do that a bit more now. First of all, visualization. You're going to need a tool. Your IDE isn't going to hack it because you can visualize the package dependencies by looking at the code uh, kind of thing. You're going to need something that parses code. You, you, know, you can't be creating these things yourself. Right? And it needs to be updatable all the time. So it has to be automatic, basically. It needs to do the work for you. It's a hierarchical dependency model that you're going to need. So just show, don't just show me all the classes because you have the big ocean of stuff. I can see how things roll up through that ocean of stuff. And I need to be able to overlay some architectural work I'm going to do on top of that. It's all very abstract. We'll get a bit more concrete in a moment. Okay. So you have a few options uh, there uh, that you can use. And this isn't complete by any means. Uh, there is a tool and a company called Sonograph, a German company. They uh, have various forms of hierarchical dependency graphs. Uh, Latix, uh, IntelliJ IDEA, and there are probably others that do a dependency structure matrix, which can roll up, so you can collapse and expand and look at, you know, look at the details here in a matrix format. And then what we use, uh, this is our own visualization called the levelized structure map, which um, kind of does both the containment and the dependencies and the levelization so that at every scope, as far as possible, the dependencies flow down through levels. So you're looking at dependency levels within each scope. And I'll describe this a bit more. But you're gonna need something. Okay. There's a few options. So step one then, visualize what you have. Okay, what is the benefit here? We're looking for an immediate help for developers. So they've got some structure, the structure can help them to some degree, they need some sort of filtered map of the code base that shows them what they're working on right now, what depends on that, maybe they can use it for navigation around their code, and where all of these bits fit in the big picture. Okay. So we're starting to, if you like, as in as much as there's a, a default de facto architecture, let show me what it is, okay? And the kinds of things at the very top level that we've already sort of established usually make some sort of, sort of sense is the Eclipse projects, IntelliJ modules, Maven poems, Java Knight modules, and so forth. <coughs> they certainly make some sense. And then within that, the packaging kind of helps too. So let's use that, right? Let's expose that to the user, to the developer, um, straight off. And if nothing else, what we're going to be doing is yeah, well, hoping 
you know, raising a certain uh, level of structural awareness. So no longer, basically structure comes from the lines of code. When a programmer is editing lines of code, he's adding in new dependencies, which is changing the structure, and he has no way of seeing the effect of that. This will at least start exposing that and make him start thinking about it. And even as time goes on, I guess, instinctively, hopefully, reduce the complexity rather than make it more complex. So this is a simple step one, if you like. So now I'm going to show you uh, that in action. What I'm showing you uh, tonight is a product we've been working on for a few years. Um, we've had a product called Structure 101 Studio for um, a long time. Uh, which is a rich client sits by itself for doing refactoring simulation and uh, architectural rule definition and that type of thing. What I'm going to show you mostly tonight, I'll show you a bit of Studio, but mostly I'll be showing you uh, a new product called Structure One Workspace, which isn't actually on our, uh, our currently advertised website, but I'll give you a secret uh, uh, place to find it later on. Um, and it sits inside an IDE. Let me show you what that's going to look like. Okay. So I guess, you know, here's your IDE, which you're all familiar with, your working way. This is Eclipse. Uh, sorry, no, this is IntelliJ. Um, and you see on the left here, this is our own code base. We've got a bunch of uh, uh, IntelliJ called the modules, and Eclipse they're called projects. I'd use the word modules. But if you're using Eclipse, think in terms of projects, Eclipse projects. And um, you've got a bunch of, uh, of modules here, I don't 30, 40 of them. And that's what you're seeing on the left hand side. When you first install um, when you first install workspace, you get a few things. One of them is this visualization here. And you can kind of drag it around. And it's got similar, I'm using the scrolling wheel here, and you can use similar gestures that you, you would try to model it on Google Maps. So it's the same kind of gestures as Google Maps. And it's basically showing you what's on the left-hand side, right? All of, at this, at this level, at the top, the top level, it's showing you the modules you've got, but sort of laid out in this, in this format here. And um, if I give myself a bit more room here, you can see it's a big wide sort of box of stuff a bunch of modules here. And you can see when I mouse over, some dependencies are appearing. Okay. So what it's doing is it's laying it out so in a way so that at the bottom, it puts any modules that don't depend on any other modules. They're only used. And then as you go up, every module is positioned so that it uses at least one thing on the layer below. It's standard graph layout. There's no, there's no particular, you know, nothing particularly fancy about that. But the effect is that you can understand the layering of your code. You can kind of understand a certain amount about the dependencies of your code. The stuff on the top row isn't used by anything else. It only uses stuff, et cetera. Just by the position of where you are. And you'll start getting used to this. It's very important, I think, to, to not be dependent on having to do all the processing in your head as to where you are in a dependency structure. So that's why we use levelization for doing that. The other thing you can do is you can drill down by just clicking. See here. Clicking and it expands. And what I'm drilling down into here is the packet structure. So I've got COM, Headway, Headway Tools, Assemblies, etc. And at each scope, it is levelizing the items within that scope. And the expanded Packages themselves are also, you know, this is, they stay in the same position. So foundation here is in a particular position relative to brands and widgets and so forth, even when it's expanded. Okay, so every scope, it levelizes it. So I'm dwelling on this a little bit because it's really important to understand, I think, the, the, the visualization because everything else is going to depend on this. So here you'll see at the scope of headway, which is expanded here, the headway package, as sub packages logging is at the bottom, doesn't use anything else within the headway package. Util uses logging, foundation uses util, brands uses util, building it up from the bottom up. Okay. 
Then we've got this kind of strange thing here, okay, we've got a red box. Red box, we call it a tank. It means that you've got a bunch of items that are cyclically dependent. Cyclically dependent items cannot be strictly levelized. So what it's going to do is it's going to try and levelize them as much as possible. So as few dependencies flow upward as possible. But basically, you can see here, there's a dependency flowing up here and one flowing up there. Uh, at any point in time, I can do things like I can spotlight. So foundation there, command click on that. It will filter the graph down to what I'm just looking at. Filter the whole model down, in fact, to what I'm looking at here. So now I can say, well, anything below foundation is what foundation uses. Anything above foundation is what uses foundation. Is what uses foundation. And when I want to see what is it inside build tools that uses foundation, I just expand it. I see here Pro Probar Scripter is what's using it, is what's using foundation. When I unspotlight, everything appears again. And now I can see inside build tools, there's a whole load of other classes in here that I didn't see when foundation was spotlit. So it actually limits the whole model, not just the level you're looking at. Okay, so now we're going to, uh, what else was I going to say? Okay, chasing dependency. Let me just show you a little bit of like how I would use this uh, structure here. Let's say I'm interested in, okay, I can see here that widgets is using something in CView. That's a feedback dependency there. What is it? Here's a question. What is it inside widgets that's using what inside CView? Right, let me answer that question. Right, what is that dependency right there? So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to, well, let me just, for instance, spotlight. Let's limit it a little bit. Command click on C view. Okay. So now the only things in here are things that are related to C view. And I see I've got layering. And inside layering, I've got piccolo. I'm just chasing, I'm just following this red line here down as I go over. Piccolo, and then inside piccolo, it's getting busy. Don't panic. I've got uh, layering widget. Inside layering widget. I've got here get tooltip text. I can see here there's a thing called get tooltip text. So let me just zoom out a little bit and remind you what I'm doing. I'm trying to find out, first of all, what is it inside this widgets package that's using something inside C view. And then I want to find out what is it using. Okay. And I can see here there's a couple of things. There's this LW actions is one of them. And the other place this red line is going is right, I've tracked it right down to this method here. Now I'm going to spotlight this method. Now, a method is down at the code level. So when I spotlight uh, a method, it's going to filter the graph. It's only going to show me the things that have a relationship with that method. But not only that, it's not going to do, it's going to do a little bit more than when I spotlight a package. It's actually going to drill into the package and find for me what it is that's being used. So you can see right there, when I Spotlit on get tooltip text. I can see here immediately what is it inside C view that is being used by get tooltip text. And so you can see I've got this get add entity string and this get instance methods. Okay. So now, as a for instance, so that's give you an idea how you can chase dependencies down. Okay. Um, I can also navigate from here. Uh, to the code, so I just alt click here. It takes me to that piece of code there. I don't know if you guys, yeah, you can see that. Can you? It's a great, great display. Okay. So you can see here. What am I looking for? Add entity string and get instance. I'm seeing those down here. Right? So this is part of a string construction. So I know I can just kind of remove that. Just to show you, I'm not saying that you would necessarily do this, but I, you can see what will happen now. And immediately, well, when I say immediately, after a couple of seconds, update the model so now that those dependencies have gone. Right? Those feedback dependencies are not there anymore. It's one dependency still there, which is flowing downward, so I don't, uh, I'm not worried about that. So, and if I do the reverse, commands, uh, command Z, and I have automatic build switched on here. You see it coming back slightly different now. You see there's a kind of a purple color there. So anytime I create any new dependencies, it's a little bit sticky. They'll come up as purple. 
they won't, they won't be, they'll be shown all the time. So it draws your attention to the fact you've just created some new dependencies. And in this case, that's quite a, it is an important piece of information because they're feedback dependencies that are kind of wrecking my, uh, my top-down structure. So. Okay, so the other thing I want to do now is show you then the other way around. So if I'm inside, uh, let me go up here. I've got this, this selection switched on here, basically follow, uh, auto follow from the source. So whenever I make a change, whenever I move around the source, it's following me around wherever the cursor is in the source. It's showing me uh, where I'm at there. So here I can see last, uh, last sort. Here it is. It's private, so it's not being used by anything outside of the class. And I can see what is it inside the class that's using it. And I, if I want to, I can I'll click and go straight to that piece of code there. And that's what I want to do. Uh, remove column, get, get column at. There's another one. Here's one that is uh, being used not so locally, right? So you can see here it's being used by another class here, this driven table, in the same package table, and then in another package, widgets.export, it's being used there, and a few other places, including this other project here, this other module, and there's a bit of code in here, just one uh, method, but there's another uh, bit of code in it. And that would be quite a, you know, when you start really using your module structure, perhaps to organize your team structure and that type of thing, you kind of want to know before you start breaking stuff in other modules. So that's a useful piece of information in its own right. And so forth, okay. So I'll go to clear here. Clear is being used by a couple of other uh, modules here at the top level, okay. Uh, what happens when I change code? Well, let me, this, this kind of comes down to as well the, uh, let me drill down here to headway uh, foundation. So here, you see here, the brands and foundation are on the same level because they don't use each other, right? But they both use util. Okay, util is, uh, foundation uses your brands uses util, but they don't use each other. What happens if I create a dependency from some of the code in foundation onto the code in brands? Well, let's have a look in here, and maybe if I, oh, where's that? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create a dependency from elementary metric here onto something in brands. You see inside brands here, there's a branding class. And I'm just gonna uncomment this bit here, and you'll see that what'll happen. Watch what happens in the visualization here. You see brands, shift it down underneath the uh, foundation package. Just undo that, Let's see it'll flood back up again. Okay. I'm actually changing the layering of the packages. I can make that even more obvious here if I did like this. See, brands and foundation here, those two there, let's focus on those. I'm gonna make that change again. Now watch what happens here. Brands is going to float in under foundation because there's a dependency now from foundation to brands. Okay, that's floating. So that's happening all the time. This is the as-built structure levelized. We haven't said what way it should be or anything yet. There's no real architecture. So likewise, the same thing is going to happen over this level. So let's say up at the let's say build tools here. I want to make a change so that something in build tools is going to use something in addition. KW4CPP. Okay. In order to do that, the first thing I'm going to have to do is actually create, uh, let me go to build tools, uh, project, I'll click on build tools. And, uh, I'm actually going to have to add in a dependency here, a module dependency on there. Okay? Okay. And we give it a minute. <coughs> So build tools has now been pushed up a level by its dependency on something on the same row. Okay, so just adjust it there. So just remember that for a minute. I'm going to come back to it shortly. I'll just undo that so that uh, I just go here. 
here removes that dependency, okay, and it should flow back down again. Okay. So that's our basic visualization. Now, let's go back to here and let's look at step two. Step two is shore, lock in and shore up the de facto architecture. jet lag when I came up with that one. Um, but what I mean by that is that, okay, in our, in our instant stage, we have a big wide row of like flat, ugly kind of mess of, cloud, of, of modules at the top level. Okay. Some of those are related to each other. Can we express that in some way? Can we specify module dependency constraints. So there are some things that do or don't depend on other things. Can we lock in place what is allowed, what do we expect to happen versus what we don't expect to happen? Okay. And then we're going to overlay all of that onto the visualization so that the guys, who, when they're working, the whole team will see the same overlay on their visualization and we'll all be working to the same architecture, the same rules, the same constraints, the same understanding of the architecture. Can we do that fairly quickly? Okay. Well, of course we can. Okay. So what I'm going to do now is click on this button here. So what I want to do is create an overlay for my workspace here. Not just mine, but the whole team can potentially use this. Okay. The way I do that is I click this edit button and this thing pops up here. Okay. It's a slightly different uh, kind of UI because it's got a selection mechanism and various things that are not, a, but not uh, don't need to be uh, used inside the IEE. But it's basically the same structure here. You can see you've got the, the four layers um, of top level modules here. And if I do nothing else, but I just say, you know, this is what it's suggesting to me based on the existing structure. If I do nothing else but say, yeah, make that so, okay, hit Command S, get back here, you can see that actually something happened there. Let's have a look here. Pretty much it looks the same as it did before, but I've got these vertical lines and horizontal lines between the things at the top level scope. Right? That just means that they're locked in place now. They're not going to float around like they were floating around before. So when I make a change now, so when I make the change to um, here, build tools, and what did I do? I added in uh, there we go. What happens now is Remember before build tools floated up, it was pushed up because it re-levelized. This time that's not going to happen. This time I can, if you can see that you've got a purple dotted line, which means you've got a violation. Because you've said this is the layering as it should be. Not just as it happens to be, but you've said no, this is as it should be. I want to know, we want to control now if it changes from this. It's not just going to happen by accident. So at this point, I might say, well, well, that's easily fixed. And I go over here, and I grab build tools here, and I say, no, move that up a level. Okay. Command S, over here, wait for it to update. And there's build tools up above. I know I have a new dependency here, but it's not actually a violation. It's a downhill, everything's happy kind of situation. Okay. So I can fix that. Or I could just not, you know, I would say, oh, yeah, it might be just a reminder that I shouldn't do that bit of code dependency stuff that I was about to do, okay, either way. But let's say that, yeah, we're okay with build tools using addition KW for CPP, and just purposes of an illustration of how the layering and stuff is working here. But what I've also said by putting build tools on the top is that it can now use all these other things on the top row. There's a total of four things now, five, four things on the top row. It can use those. Let's say I didn't want it to do that. I only wanted to use addition KW for CPP, but not these other ones. How can I express that? Well, to do that, 
I'm going to take build tools and what was it, KW for CPP. And I'm going to wrap those, create a wrapper cell. And then I'm going to grab those two and just move it down to the same row as those other guys. And S, over here. And you'll see, hopefully, what you want to see there, which is, there you have. Build Tools is now allowed to use additional KW for CPP. But both of those together are in a group at the same level as the other guys. So they're not allowed to branch out sideways. So I've expressed that. So I'm starting to think now about what is supposed to use what. This is the shoring up, adding a bit of value to the de facto architecture that we've already built. Okay, okay so let me just undo that for a minute. And undo that, undo that. Um, one other thing to note here. Um, you see here, let's say, I was talking about grouping together. This is all a bit unstructured here at this level. If I click, if I spotlight parser.net, you can see there's a couple of other .NET related um, projects here. And if I go here, I'm going to say uh, generic is the same. There's a few generic related uh, artifacts or projects that kind of belong together. So what I can do there is actually group them together and give them maybe a color. So let's say the .NET parser, .NET, come here. There it is there, and the, just chasing the dependencies here, there's three of them. I'm gonna create a wrapper cell, I'm gonna call that, where is it here? So now, instead of the three uh, entities here, I've got a single entity that sort of represents all three. Okay. So following that same principle, then I'm just going to go over to here, and I'm going to change uh, this one here. This one here. So I just did the same kind of thing for I don't know, 15, 20 minutes. Try, try different ways of grouping things around. And I came up with this. Okay. Where I've got build tools now. Okay. And then inside here, you can see there's that .NET group that I created earlier. Okay, with the three sub uh, modules in it. And I did the same for our generic product, Java product, C++ Ada products. Right? And then I took all of those language packs and I put them inside a languages group. So I did that kind of thing here. I did something similar with vendor. So now when the guy's browsing around, he'll be seeing the code inside all of these as he did before, but it's now got some sort of semantic meaning at the top level. Okay. And I can see here that, for instance, these are our different vendors. We've got Clarity uh, is one of our vendors. Uh, they uh, ship a C++ and a .NET and a Java product. Clockworks, uh, they, they ship a C++ and a Java product. We are QA, C++ only. Ourselves, Structure 101, we have, all, we have versions of the product for all this. All that stuff is, is, is shown right in there. And now when I start doing, uh, I start moving around, let's say here, and I start looking at some of these things here, switch following on. here very quickly. I've color coded the languages and you know so I can see very quickly there that you know the same kind of visualizations I was seeing before but I've got the additional groupings here languages C++ languages Java whatever I kind of grouped those things together okay 
the other thing, let me just go home again there. So the other thing I could might want to do, let me hit refresh here just so that I got the latest version of it. Uh, I could also do, here's a, an instance now of, if I look at um, build tools here, okay, if I select the Java thing here, I can see build tools is using one of the four additions here under the Java area, right? That sort of stands out, let's say, right? I can say, well, do you know what? It shouldn't do that. So I could just go over here and change its visibility from public to private when padlock appears. I save it over here. And I should see now a little red arrow, a little red line is appearing here. So although it's downward, right? It's saying, hold on, there's something here. You said there's something, it's doing something here that it shouldn't be. And I can quickly drill in to languages and find out, oh, it's something in Java. It's uh, this one here, edition KW or Java is being used. It shouldn't be using that. But, wait a minute, okay, next day someone's going to put in a dependency from build tools to this project. Why don't I express that right now, that none of these things should be used externally, right? They're all in the, if you like, an implementation layer. Okay? So change that guy back to public, take all four of those there. Create a wrapper now and make the wrapper itself private. And let's see what happens here. And you can see I've got the same, the exact same violation of my architectural rules now. Okay, same one. But it's been caused slightly differently. It's been caused because of this whole group here is now private. And not only that, but that means that the next time uh, somebody creates a dependency on any of the other items that will also flag a dependency error. Okay. So I'm starting now, this is what I call the, the shoring up, I suppose, of the existing architecture. This is all really easy to do so far. Okay. Now, final step. Yeah, if we go back to our PowerPoint. So the last five minutes. <coughs> this final step is quite a big step. Um, in the sense of, to talk about, right, there's a whole another um, presentation on just this stuff here. But let me just go through it now and uh, uh, give you an idea of what's involved. Okay. The next step is, so now we've got this sort of reason, it looks pretty good at the top level. We've got um, the 30 or 40 modules have been given some grouping, some structure, we've got some stuff that's private. We've said quite a lot of guidance that is just locking that in place. And that's what the developers are seeing when they're browsing around. Okay. Problem is that within there you've got huge projects with a lot of uncontrolled structure. Okay. So what do we want to do about that? This is very common. What we really want to be doing is pulling out modules from these monoliths. They may be Java 9 modules. I don't know if any of you guys have started looking at Java 9, but the first thing you want to do is, well, okay, let's create a Java 9 module. How do I do that? How do I create one out of this big monolith? You can, it's, it's, it's not trivial to do because Java 9 modules, like Maven modules or IntelliJ modules, cannot be cyclically dependent. So you have to kind of go through a bit of a process there. So what does that involve? Well, if you've got a nice acyclic package structure, you can start pulling packages from the bottom levels out into modules. That's kind of easy. Lift them out, you start separating out, and put some controls on it then. You've got a much finer granularity then um, of, of control over the dependencies at a, at a deeper level. Next thing you can do is if you don't, if, you, if your modules are not nice and acyclic, they're actually tangled then you can start disentangling the packages in preparation for uh, pulling some of them up into modules. Uh, if, it's, if they're small and easy, you can do that in the code. Right? You can just go in and say, well, okay, where's my cyclic dependencies? Kind of like I showed you very early on in the, in the demo, where you sort of chase down the dependencies, you figure out what's causing it, you create an interface, or you do whatever the necessary is 
so that you don't have a feedback dependency. You move on to the next one. And then, once they're disentangled, you can then lift out the lower packages into modules. Okay. Um, if it's a broader problem than that, so you're going to have to do a lot of changes and you've got to do a bit of thinking about this. Okay, this is, this is going to be, I want six things moving from this package to that package. I need to create a new package with some common stuff in it. And all of those, all of those actions have to happen together. Right? Then you're going to want to simulate that first. So that you know, you don't want to just start blundering into the code doing stepwise changes. Uh, because you don't know where you're going yet. Right? So that's where simulation kicks in. Um, and you're going to move the classes and then refactor for the dependencies. Okay. Finally, you can do, um, if there's another kind of a situation where you've got, a, you know, you've got the classic monolith of, you know, very tangled code. And then you've got a function you want to pull out of that, which is actually distributed all over the place. It's not in one of the bottom packages. There may be some classes from this package, some from that package, some from that package, and anyway, all of the packages are cyclically dependent. Well, pull them out and define an interface uh, to that new module. Um, and so you, you have that as your target. And then you're going to have to go in and make the changes to the code so that you can then sub subsequently uh, create the module once the dependencies are repaired. So you kind of pre-repair the dependencies, if you like. It's all fairly abstract. It's a, it's a, it's a deep topic, um, but that's the general kind of gist of it. And if I show you uh, just briefly um, how we go about some of those activities here. Uh, this is uh, Structure 101 Studio. This is our sort of uh, long stand and had this product for, for quite a long number of years and, and very successfully used for just this kind of thing. But let me just give you an idea without going too much into it. The visualization should be quite familiar to you. The one thing that is kind of new or different in Studio is that I can do things like this. I can see that Thread Local Utilities has a two-way dependency on this basis package put it in there for the moment. And this other server utility, put it in there for the moment. Ah, that removed util from my tangle. Let's have a look and see what's causing the feedback dependency here. The whole package here, move it up there. Uh, a group of, a tangle of three classes, they belong together, but they're in their own package. Put them there, okay. do that kind of thing. So you can simulate the kind of changes that you might want to make. Okay, and then if we go back to looking at the file, uh, the one we were just looking at, so this is our own code base. Um, here I've got the core module here. You might be looking inside here, and you can see, ah, now Piron, that's licensing stuff. Look at that, licensing stuff is only used by build tools. None of my other projects are, are dependent on it, and yet, if I select the whole module, everything is using the whole module here. So in other words, a change here to my licensing code, although it only really affects build tools, um, everything else is kind of implicated. So why don't I just move that out of there? Okay. Likewise inside here, this is our <coughs> core kind of component here. I've got logging, util, foundation. They could all be pulled out. Right? This is the sort of peeling out packages from the bottom levels, if you like. Uh, and then finally, there's a, there's a sort of a more, uh, you know, I can do things like create, uh, add a new module called, uh, let's say, uh, log, uh, let's say util, let's say uh, foundation. Okay. There's my foundation module. I might say, well, do you know what? You know, I wouldn't probably do it this way in our case, but let's move it there. Ooh. There's a big mess there. Um, let's, the first thing to do is to, actually not that, but let's move Nalpiron into a new licensing module. So you create your modules, you drag the stuff in, and, and so forth. Um, so that allows you to do some fairly deep um, evaluation, and you can set up like a target. This is where it gets uh, kind of interesting. You can set up a target 
an architectural overlay for the team. That they see inside workspace, and they can see that they can see the bad dependencies that are that are there for when I want to get to the target location, and I can start repairing those inside the workspace. Okay. I think I'm down to about a minute, so I'm going to stop right there and just ask. Uh, first of all, are there any quick questions, burning questions that might have a short answer? Yeah, quick question. Is it, is it? Capable, like maybe to like identify like some sort of entry point from, of the application and then drill down from there, like uh, maybe some sort of a controller, like in a yeah. Can you? Is it all capable of identifying like maybe some entry point in the application or something? Um, yeah, you. There are various tools inside Studio that will help you find those kind of things. You can do a pet dependency analysis, find the closure of dependencies upward or downward. And quite often, if you go upward, you'll be finding it'll be identifying your like, if you like your main uh, functions, your main uh, methods. Okay. Thank you. Do that kind of thing. Sure. Uh, when you're showing the dependencies, are you showing intermediate dependencies? Like in other words, if A is dependent on B and B is dependent on C, do you just show A dependent on C, or do you show all of those? A on B is always so A on B to C, so A on B, we just see that show that dependence. And that shows the you can do what's called tagging where you can say find me the closure and things. You can do that. You can do that kind of analysis. But by default we just show the immediate dependencies. Uh, and my other question is um, do you are there any dependencies that you don't that you can't sense? Is that possible? Like reflection we can't we don't sense. Um, but we do pick up yeah, spring injected dependencies, XML, the, you know, that are in XML and that other thing. A few things we do. For the most part, it's the part of static dependencies that we pick up. Um, so if you, you have a very oh, working uh, model from an architecture, now developers mess it up. Can you plug this your code into CI tool or somewhere? Tells you that you yes, you can. Yeah, 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 you can. Uh, there's a component called Structure One on Build that can be called headless without the UI that does whatever checking you ask it to do. So the sort of things you would expect to be able to check, you can check at build time. Thanks. Yeah, um, I was wondering, <coughs> in practical purposes, is there a way? When you, uh, someone sends me a code review of, say, 1,000 lines, I always have to figure out how the architecture changed first. I'm wondering if there would be an integration to get rid of the, the underlying file format so that whenever someone refactored, like you just did in front of us, in the code review also, that shows that, OK, yeah, the architecture yeah. changed. Yeah, in, in both products, it's possible to do comparisons. And so that blueness, that, you, that purple kind of color that shows I've got a new depend dependency and or new items, it gets color coded. You can actually, you can force the inside workspace, you could do that by checking out the pre-commit, uh, then check out the post-commit, and you'll be able to browse then the colors uh, around. Uh, you know. And there's various other ways you can do that too. Okay, great. Uh, I might just um, very quickly point out, uh, wait a minute, I just have to go forward in time here. Um, just there, you might want to take a of, of, of this here. Um, the website I told you about, which is our new website, not yet uh, public released, is 2018.structure101.com. If you would like a complimentary 12 month subscription to Workspace for being so kind as to coming along tonight. Um, you need to go to this uh, bit.ly slash nyjavasig. It's case sensitive. Uh, if you go there so within the next 24 hours or so, um, you just enter your email address and you'll get uh, a complimentary 12-month um, subscription to the Workspace part of the product. 
and I would be really delighted. Uh, Chris at structure101.com if you have any other questions uh, you know, that came up during, that you thought of during the talk. And also when you're using the, the, the product, um, you can get the product anytime, by the way. Anyone can get the product for 30 days or whatever to trial anyway. Uh, but if you have any comments or thoughts on the usability of the product and questions on how to use it for your own environment, uh, just let me know directly at Chris at Structure